take further into this, we welcome on stage Alexei Tamas, who is the co-inventor of the Frogance uh, technology and is back tonight with us to tell us about the way you create and publish a Frogance site on the internet. Alexei, uh, for those who were not here yesterday, could you uh, tell us about your role um, and your involvement in the Frogance uh, project? Well, first of all, good evening to all of you. Thank you for being back here tonight. As I said yesterday, my role in this project is uh, first with Amohi that we initiated this project. Also, I looked into the technical side of things um, for this set of technologies that build up the uh, uh, Frogance technology, and also I've been working on the promotion of this technology among the users on, in the ecosystem uh, with the technical communities to whom uh, I need to uh, whom I need to address and answer the questions of. Um, now, uh, I know that you have changed your presentation because we heard a number of questions yesterday uh, off the wreck. Uh, people asking what is the relationship between the frequency uh, address and size, etc. So, uh, Alexey, would you please tell us how the whole Frogans technology works, that is, the Frogans addresses, the sites, the FCR operator? Well, yesterday I um, made a presentation to uh, explain the fact that the technology works on top uh, of the internet layer as a software layer. I will now take a look at it from the other side. That is, uh, look at it from the angle of the use, the user. So immediately uh, you see that this is a technician's slide, it's not an ambassador's slide, it's a bit more intricate and uh, not quite as legible, but uh, it's uh, been a streamlined, I can assure you. So the programs technology is seen by the user. In this uh, diagram, you see the user at the top right, the end user, and to the left, a pile of players, key players in the publication of sites. So I'll go through these players and I'll tell you about the various arrows that connect all these pieces. First of all, the user, the end user, who is the most important person in our system, uh, anyone browsing from home or on, on the go. And this person will be browsing on a frozen site like they would be doing mm, with uh, other um, systems today on email, chat and so on, or phoning, um, voice over IP or uh, exchanging data or doing vi video conference, which we are currently doing actually with the streaming. On the other side you have backstage, the backstage, that is the back end that produces the uh, Frogans um, sites. We start with OP3FT, which is our organization which um, owns and uh, promotes, protects and, and uh, helps uh, prom uh, develop and pro improve the Frogans uh, technology. And this organization, in fact, delegated um, uh, to STG uh, Interactive, which is the original founder of the project actually a few years back, um, uh, to operate the FCR, that is the Frogans uh, core registry. We'll get back to this later on. Which, what is important is that at the top left, you have the Frogans sites publishers, the people who actually produce uh, Frogans sites, which, who have things, contents to share. There can be people, you have many um, publications uh, on the internet of people who uh, produce, who publish, and also organizations from the smaller to the largest in terms of uh, uh, brand awareness uh, and, and, and uh, you have big names uh, such as uh, Google, uh, the services revolving around these websites, uh, Facebook and many uh, also um, uh, e-merchants. But the internet is not just about these big publishers, but it's hundreds of millions of websites that are published with people who have contents to share for a given community of users. So in our system, 
you may have by now understood that we have uh, programs uh, addresses and sites. The relationship between the sites and the addresses is simple. When you publish a Frogan's site, you need to have an address. It's like in the web uh, universe, when you publish a web site, you need to have a domain name to allow the um, internet users to uh, access your site. And Frogan's works pretty much the same way. Um, uh, all these sites need identifiers for internet users to find them, so you have these Frogan's addresses. The role of the operator precisely is to operate this uh, address database so that it remains unique um, at the time of the registration, that the same address not be uh, given to two people. So this uniqueness is, is essential. And the, the third uh, st stage in the opening of a program site is that you need to resolve the address. And this will be a very um, uh, uh, extensive uh, activity when you think of the 2.7 billion people and 4 billion in the future to be served on, on the web and using the web. Um, the company that um, uh, is in charge of the dot coms, uh, the, the, the domain names that are dot com uh, domain names, the very sign, uh, makes billions and billions uh, uh, address resolution uh, operations per day. So you need to have a very solid and, and massive infrastructure for this. And the last actor I didn't mention is the fact <clears throat> these addresses cannot be registered directly with the register. Um, registry, because it's a technical um, uh, operator, you need to go via uh, another entity, which is the FCR, account administrator. But this, Romuald, uh, will tell you later on uh, about this. We'll tell you about this. Um, so these are the people or entities via whom the frequency addresses can be registered when a site or publishers wants to have them um, online. And uh, so you hear about the various types of addresses that you can register later on. So these are the various players. What, what else? Now, basically, you have an internet user who will say at the time T, oh, I've heard about Frogans, I would like to use this. And for this, he, she will need to download Frogans Player, a, a software which will allow them to gain access to these Frogans sites and contents for each one of the terminals that is supported. We have a version, uh, respective versions of Frogans Player that can be downloaded. The technical team told you about this yesterday. So, where do they get these? They um, in, have a site which is hosted um, at an address called get.frogans, but Julie will tell you about this later on, and uh, will tell you why it's a not a dot .net address. So, this, this is where you can download or from applications stores like you would from your mobile device. So, first step downloading. Mm. Fast, simple, free of charge. Mm. You don't need to register your email address. It's very basic software without any commitments except uh, you going by the rules of uh, uh, using software. And we heard um, a presentation about this yesterday. And so once you've downloaded the Frogan's player, you need to enter a Frogan's address. I will not tell you the format now, but you heard that there was a star somewhere in the character string. So you enter a, an address, and instead of entering uh, the address, you could also click on the link, because for the Frogan's layer uh, supported by this technology works in interaction with the other existing software layers. So there are links on a web page or an email. You could have a link to Frogan site, for instance, which would allow the internet users to click on a page or an email to directly open the Frogan site, uh, which would refer back to the um, uh, software. And it's just like you had entered the the address. Uh, remain two um, short steps. First, the address resolution. That is, the Frogan player software will resolve the address with the operator or one of the servers of this operator to be able to retrieve the data 
uh, which will allow the, the Frovens player to then open up, uh, to get open and um, allow for browsing on the Frovens uh, side. And if you're interested, you'll see that this is done through a protocol that was uh, developed by OP3FT, which is F FNSS, uh, <coughs> Pro Frovens Network Language system which allows you to have secure resolution with uh, electronic signature to be sure that the resolution, although here on the internet network that is materialized with this kind of cloud, although there are intermediaries who try to change the, the data, in fact, the Frovens player software will realize this uh, through the electronic signature system, so it will not uh, allow itself to be diverted to another dummy address, for instance. Uh, but Julie will tell you about this, the fact that all the servers that are uh, kind of working in the background without being visible to the user, uh, Julie will tell you why it's called fcr.frogans and not .net at the end. She will tell you. So I'm preparing the grounds for Julie. Um, so once you've um, resolved the address that step three is over, then the, the data that Froven's player has retrieved around the address that was entered by the user will allow Froven's player to start up a communication with the server containing the program site. Now, you need to know that these servers containing the program site are not dedicated uh, servers or ones that are centralized on the internet. There's some score of, um, of uh, servers that can host frozen site. Any type of server could host a frozen site, I mean, and any existing server. Uh, this is um, also uh, by way of answering uh, the, a question we heard yesterday, uh, how difficult it is to enter the world of fragrance. Not difficult, there was no reinventing the wheel where it was not needed to do so. So, the fragrance player software will start browsing on the fragrance sites, and you see the word slides is written here. It's the word that uh, designates the page of the fragrance site, and this slide will be downloaded, will be displayed on the user's screen, and then displayed uh, to allow the user to browse on it. Yesterday, in my presentation about um, what is the Frogan technology, I showed what is a Frogan site, what are its many components, various components, and you, you see it appears on the screen with links, and these links on the Frogan site will allow you to s um, navigate from one slide to another, and every time the user clicks on the Frogan site, then again you load another slide, another page. The technology that supports this is a language which was also created at um, uh, pre the uh, Frogan's slide description language, FLDS, which allows you to FSDL, uh, which allows you to format also the pages. I think this is just about uh, what I had to say on this slide. I would not like to simplify your presentation, but globally, in fact, um, we find the same type of players as in the publication of websites, for instance. Um, so what would be interesting now would be to hear about the stakeholders, who are the real people who can um, uh, embody the various roles that you just described. Well, without mm, anticipating too much, because I still have another mm, slide that is even more complicated than this one, so uh, just a few things before I do. Um, we have just seen a number of players here uh, concerning the addressing, but around these uh, site publishers, we have a set of uh, players of stakeholders that we need to look at. So, here we go. I will not expect you to be able to read everything, but this is our, say, the best possible representation of the internet ecosystem around the users that are supported by Frogrance Technology, that is publication. Yesterday, Sebastian uh, uh, offered uh, several representations of the internet ecosystem. This is not a representation of the old internet, it's only those players that we feel are concerned 
by the fragrance technology. So it's not as ambitious as um, uh, the whole uh, the whole wide the world wide. So uh, getting back to the looking at this um, diagram in simpler way, you could turn like this. So you start from this red uh, square, the red box is the end user whom we spoke about. He could be anywhere uh, behind a device. And then you have the boxes or men in gray, all the people who contribute um, contents directly. So you have big families in the publishing business, whether it's uh, uh, websites, local websites, communities, regions, the cities. Um, uh, websites published by um, trademarks, uh, e-commerce, uh, search engines, uh, directories, um, listing other sites, major sites. We spoke about these big names uh, earlier. And then uh, behind uh, this uh, uh, bar here, you have internet uh, provider, service providers, your ISPs, uh, manufacturers, uh, equipment manufacturers, uh, um, applications providers, and, and stores also. All these uh, players are in direct relationship. These uh, boxes are not always uh, uh, separate sum uh, will provide a, uh, an overlap between equipment manufacturing and um, applications, for instance. Some will also be involved in connections to the mobile network. So uh, there's a consolidation process uh, between all the various players. But we still have quite a number of websites, and uh, maybe the concentration that we see uh, around large um, social networks uh, Leave, still leave room for many other uh, websites, uh, independent uh, websites, and this will be of interest for our own technology. So we are in the world of the publishers here on the right-hand side, top right. But these publishers, they need technicians, they need operators to operate their sites. In the blue part, top left, you have a number of um, players related to the production of contents. So you see, here you have the one that does everything, uh, the webmasters, um, who do just about everything, all and everything, uh, to, uh, to operate a site. But the bigger the sites, the bigger you see that the task will be um, uh, distributed among several players, for instance, to produce dynamic uh, contents with Java, .NET, etc., to produce contents. And you have also people who work directly on HTML, on the web language, and the CSS also for, for the style sheets. Then you have the designers working on the ergonomics of the contents. And all these people work in agencies, either advertising, communication agencies, others around the <coughs> content supply. You have also the referencing agencies around the search engines, those providing a publication system and so on. And to the far left, you have web agencies, um, IT service companies that produce complex devices on the web. When you have a booking uh, system, uh, a site for um, uh, flights, for instance, it may be more complicated. Um, so all these uh, professionals organize themselves around specific projects around websites that are then published here. Now, uh, there are some very important players here who actually uh, provide uh, the frameworks, application framework, uh, which um, then allow these professionals to work faster to produce sites uh, um, more swiftly, uh, easily in their coding and publishing. And so you have environments that are and tools that are created either by applications developers, developers or server developers and so on. You have quite a number of um, people involved there. So <clears throat> let me continue with the uh, bottom left, that is the people who operate all this. Once you've produced the contents, you put this into operation. So this is where you start seeing the hosting providers, those who provide the addressing chain, the registrars, 
People selling domain names are those who provide certificates to secure the system and a number of players around uh, trademark protection because, of course, this is where there could be many problems from the moment you allow people to register identifiers on the Internet. And, of course, then behind this, you have the uh, connectivity suppliers who are a bit like... Um, uh, the, the, like the ISPs, you know, the uh, internet uh, service providers, um, but for the hosting, they're just uh, they they are in the business of the big pipes uh, to uh, transmit the data, and then you have the register registries uh, dot com and dot fr etc. and then, uh, with the dotted lines, you have two uh, players to close the loop. The um, uh, Frogan's core registry, which will be one of the registries operating on the internet, and the OB3FT, right in the middle of this pink area, which in fact brings together all the organizations that work towards the standardization of the technologies, uh, publishing technologies, on which OP3FT is based, uh, because uh, OP3FT uses the technologies of IETF or W3C, like XML, for instance, uses technologies developed by Unicom, Unicode, for, instance, uh, for international domain names, for instance, as we will hear later on. You know, there's been work that's been done, uh, of programs, uh, and then WIPO, uh, ICANN, with whom um, uh, uh, OP3FT is in a strong relationship with the new uh, GTLD, uh, dot programs, and also in this uh, ecosystem, consultants, um, people writing tutorials, and people contributing to this uh, uh, system. So all these players, quite early on um, in the programs projects, have a place, a role to play. It's not a big deal in, in a way. It's just a little thing more for them to do. That's that's why we have an ambassador because this uh, emergence of a new internet layer. Uh, there's not been much in terms of layers since the, the web. So people have not been used to the web, web being the reference. So when you arrive with a new um, layer, you need to convince people so that they can be um, open to uh, these new opportunities and see what it will change for them, what's in it for them as well. It doesn't change a lot for everyone. So every professional in the Internet working on the web today has a very little step to make to adapt and adapt their practices to the use of the Frogan's technology. And OP3FT in this has an important role in advocating um, this uh, technology and uh, meeting the various players in the system to explain what it is about and what is needed for them to do uh, to uh, start joining the game. This is why it's um, uh, called uh, business opportunities in the internet ecosystem because the aim is to allow a new ecosystem to blossom on top of the fragrance uh, layer and uh, professionals, startups and so on are most welcome to come and develop their own business activities on this layer. So thank you, Alice. To um, summarize, we see that there are only two boxes there in dotted lines. These players are already existing and will not change. They are fundamental. I can imagine that the end user, the one who will browse on the frozen side, is the same who would be uh, browsing on the websites today. And what you're telling us is that all these other players have a minimum effort to make to um, join the bandwagon. Uh, in green, for instance, to offer registration services for Frogan's addresses and uh, all the added value services that they have been used to selling uh, with uh, their previous activities. And, uh, top left in blue, it's about the people who used to uh, develop uh, websites who would be invited to develop frozen sites uh, like uh, also um, uh, and also any 
individual persons who might like to do so. So uh, having said this, uh, uh, I'd like to focus on the blue part and for, for us, uh, for you to tell us about the frozen site and the language that you refer to is that this FSDL, that is a frozen slide description language, so that we can better understand how we can uh, develop a frozen site and put it, um, make it available on the internet. Yes, indeed. Um, Mm. We'll now look at it with new eyes. Uh, where will the Frogan site be hosted? The Frogan site uh, of the publishers. Um, so, uh, Frogan site, in fact, is a number of pages of slides, each one of which is coded uh, and developed with the um, F FSDL language based on XML. This language, we uh, tried our best to make it easy to use, fairly uh, use, uh, easy to use. And when a technician says fairly easy, uh, you know, it's still uh, <laughs> likely to be difficult. But what we did is to make FSDL that um, we wanted FSDL to be manually encodable. In fact, it's not that scary. You know, uh, uh, at the beginning of the web, when the, the web started, uh, the inventors of the web also uh, proposed a language. It was not XML at the time because it did not exist. But it looked a bit like this. It was also the same type of language. And to make a uh, uh, website with beacons, you know, you, 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 you tried something, if it worked well, and you, put, you posted the results on your server. In fact, it's the same here. In, in terms of approach, it's the same. Oh, of course, since then, HTML has become a huge um, system, particularly with HTML5, and it does so many things that it, again, becomes difficult to learn the language. As I said yesterday, there are hundreds of phases of specifications. Don't try to print it out because uh, you'll jam your machine and you'll destroy the rainforest because <clears throat> if you uh, print out only uh, the specification, it will be a thousand pages. In the Frogan's uh, specification, it will be uh, much uh, more uh, environmentally friendly with fewer pages, much fewer. And for reasons of security, we try to um, make the basic operations through description and not through programming. In other words, the scripts, I mean the Java scripts and, and other scripting systems, they're not not authorized in the FSDL language. Uh, in HTML, you know there's JavaScript, and this is particularly the strength of the HTML pages as they are used uh, and seen today. Now, with a programs and the program site in FSDL, there are descriptors, and these descriptors will allow you to um, obtain a certain number of effects uh, expected by the user. For instance, uh, to have buttons, you know, um, when you uh, uh, drag your mouse and you want, or with your phone, you want to uh, activate something with a button, you have some graphic uh, effects that allow you to know whether the button is active or not. And with FSDL, it's done through description. That is, the, uh, the page developer will tell you uh, this is the way a world tell the system. This is how it should look when the user activates the button, presses the button, and this is what it should look like when he does not. So <clears throat> it's not instructions that are being passed on over uh, if you do this, something will happen, and if you do this, then uh, something else will happen, and so this will not. No, it's much simpler. Um, this is something that often happens with certain web pages. Now, this is the first point. It's a description language, one which allows you to very simply uh, format contents in uh, the programs uh, slides. Our idea was that a beginner without any special training should be able to make these pages. No need for university to be a university graduate to make it. Immediately from the start of the project with Amory, we carried out experiments at an early stage with youngsters at school, at high school around 15 years old, and we said, not necessarily geeks. We said, try to play around 
with our FSDL and they could make pages very quickly. In a half day or a full day, they could do creative things. We're very satisfied and we maintain that effort. In terms of language design, to keep it constantly within everyone's reach. Now we do it by hand, because it's easy to do. You can see that in FSDL, whenever you add a, a component, it's added on top of the previous one, in the visual order. And when you find that it's too, it's in the front, and you want to put it in the back, you just reverse the order of the tags to find it in the second, in the background. If you want to make a button, just capture a set of components and put them in the tag and say that that's the button. No need to ask yourself any question, just ask yourself where does the button go? Does it go in another page? Is it to open up a web page because you're entitled from a Frogan's uh, site to open a web page? Is it for an email? All of that can be done and it's very easy to implement in terms of code. Now, the fact that the language can be based on XML will allow us to integrate Frogan sites in terms of hosting in traditional servers, HTTP servers, and above all, it will allow us to interface them with existing programs for developers making more sophisticated sites that change depending on conditions or adapting to entries made by users. Well, these developers can work in PHP, Java, any language you find in a server can be used naturally, so without any adjustments in particular. I think we've done every possible experiment with interactions to make FSDL, but from dynamic programs, but it's not a feat, it's just XML files. All you have to do is to create the right template, compliant with the language, and you'll get a result. One last thing, because that's not like quite like on the web, but it does satisfy users and developers. The fact of having adapted XML as a system of representing Frogan's slides, that urges to go all the way. XML is a language for we have an XML expert in the back of the room, so I'm speaking under your control, Mohammed. Tell me if it's not if I'm not quite right. But XML is a, is a very rigorous description language for developing languages too that can also be equally rigorous. The fact of adopting XML as a basic system that enabled us to go all the way and to realize that if a developer here puts a fork and slide that is not well formatted, giving instructions that do not end or doing something that's non-compliant, trying to end the data that's unexpected. Well, the Frogan's reader, the Frogan's player I spoke of earlier, as they receive this document, will analyze it very strictly. And if they see that there's something wrong, bam, they pull it aside and they display an error page. You may say it's horrible, because users will have error pages, so that's really not cool. But that's not what will happen. That's what we started to realize. Since it displays an error page, well, the developer is very careful. They're careful because they'd be ashamed if for an error page to pop up when you publish something on site. So they'll be rigorous in coding. That's not hard. You just close a, a tag, you open up a bracket, then you close it. You open up a tag and you close it. And you use the right syntax once you've opened up your tag as well with the FSDL language. And the advantage with this is that it's very easy to be rigorous. And it doesn't bother them at all. The second important benefit for OP3FT is security. Once you refuse to take uh, things that don't work in, your work is largely simplified in terms of security. You don't try to bounce back and look at what could have been done, what the guy was trying to do, because when you start to work like that in IT, that's the beginning of the end. You start saying to yourself, okay, if you didn't close the tags, it's because you wanted to say this. You may take this or that measure to correct that error. And then you may say, no, you made a second one, but it's a bit contradictory with the other one. What do we do? Let's do this. And then finally, you did a third thing that was not expected, contradicting the other two. And the developer, after a while, he's sick and tired of imagining every possible event. He says, return. He sends it back. 
and he says, okay, we'll see later. And what happens then? You let something go that may be serious, and this is where the attack begins. So if you try to be cool at the beginning by saying, okay, just let it go, we'll do nice and easy passing, you develop 90% of your code and something that wasn't expected, and you're rendering a service to developers who could have made an effort, the big loser, after the OP3FT that would have failed in this mission, is the end user. Because the OP3FT, they're ashamed, but at the same time, it's the user who has a problem because he's the user whose telephone or his tablet were hacked. So in FSDL, I may have been a bit lengthy, John Manuel, but in FSDL, we have a lot of principles with respect to simplicity, ease of use. In other words, the tags must be simple, it must be easy to program, and also so powerful concepts in terms of security to enable a rigorous analysis of code. Well, code. I mean the file that's analyzed by Frogan's player and all of this. And I can continue for three hours on this, so I'll stop here. All of this will lead to browsing or to a programming that's very simple and to browsing that to be highly secure. So there you have it. They were rounded the circle. FSDL is a very important cornerstone of the entire system in focus. It's not the only one. As I said earlier, we also have a language here that makes it possible to re resolve addresses, FNSL, as I said before. And there are other languages, I won't go all the way, but that can make it possible to make all of this work on the network. Thank you, Alexi. Let me point out that we already said this, but these languages are still being developed. There are prior versions, prior releases, but they will not be used in the forthcoming release of forecast technology. Now, what I'm thinking of, and I'm often asked this question, and you spoke about this yesterday, you have multi-platform, but also the fact that you can have quick and easy access to a frogan site when you're on the go, especially when the bandwidth is a bit, well, insufficient, or when the mobile connection, 3G, um, edge or H are a bit whimsical on your mobile, and sometimes in many cases you can't open your website to have access to your content. Now, the focus technology, is it suited to that problem, to managing that problem that bothers end users? Well, the key principles, of course, what we had at the outset, was that you can access the Frogan's website in all types of networks. There may be fast networks, slow networks, and you can do that quickly in all cases. In our founding principles, you saw yesterday that Frogan's site and I will show you a mock-up later on, but they're small in size. They don't have the size of a website, so we have one advantage in that we are transporting less data for each page, probably. But we said it's not enough, because in our experiments at the very beginning of the project, in the first five or six years, we had lots of experiments with many publishers, and we realized that after all, developers weren't very rigorous, and even though it ended up with very few pixels on the screen, it didn't bother them to put a four megapixel picture for it to end up as a small icon on a page. You can see that on some websites, and not that many anymore, but very often the small ID picture, and you click on it, and you see something huge, five megapixels, and you realize that it's a pity to use the bandwidth for that. So for everything to run smoothly for us all the time, we have an, an FSDL, we have imposed limit on FSDL size so as to force developers to optimize at the source. Typically, in the first releases of FSDL, FSDL 2.1, the one that was running as a prototype for several years, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, up to 2005 or 2006, I believe, we limited the size of each slide to 64 kilobytes including pictures. You may say, what can you do with 64 kilobytes? That's nothing. 
It's a, a piece of grain of sand. You can do a lot. You can do most of what you do on a fork and slide. You can do it with far less than that. Even at the time, we considered that 100 kilobytes was a lot. And we even classified fork and slides in category. And we call this between 34 and 60 kilobytes. You'd say this is fat. It's too big to begin with. We found it was, wasn't quite optimum. We managed to do a lot of things with just with a size that small. Now, with respect to the growth of networks, networks have become faster, bigger. We could have said, OK, let's now increase. We don't care. Let's make it one megabyte. We won't. We won't do so, so that our program sites can remain very uh, light, easily consultable, regardless of your network, if you access network. Everyone uses 3G, 4G in Europe, the other countries with less connectivity. Jerome spoke about China. In some regions, we don't have a lot of connectivity. There's still a lot of places around the world with little connectivity. Sometimes you don't need to go far. Just take the subway. And between two subway stations, the bandwidth is negligible. You find it a bit later on. And that's exactly when you wanted information, precisely when you have no throughput. The fact of having small slides that will enable us to recover things much more quickly and simply on the network, and therefore to be able to serve more fluidly. We won't have to wait to download 200 or 300 kilobytes. That may take a lot of time, in actual fact. So from theory to practice, Fogan sites, we hope that they'll be consultable very soon and one and very rapidly. You download small size content. You also use less your terminal and therefore the memory of your terminal, the computing power on the terminal as well. And that has a huge benefit in terms of energy savings. And even though mobile terminals are increasingly, uh, well, have a, uh, increasingly good batteries, we know that the applications use a lot of battery. Programs won't, and it won't force you to recharge your mobile terminal every two hours after serving on a program site, for example. Okay. I had other questions for you, but since you said that, you'll be showing us a prototype, I saw eyes opening up wide. So I'll probably let you give us a demonstration of a, a mobile app terminal. And then we'll come back to a series of questions, because I believe that we're far from having covered all the issues. FSDL still reserves a lot of surprises for us and many features we haven't yet spoken of. I just turned off a phone, so we won't put that one on because we can see a wonderful logo that's pretty well known. Okay, no, 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 don't use the bandwidth here. No, this is a prototype, so it's not connected, so no risk. What I wanted to show you quickly is that yesterday you saw, I may show you one later on for those who were there yesterday, but program sites can occupy on screen well, let's look for it, after all. I'll try and get it. Just wait a moment. What I can say in the meantime, on this diagram, you said earlier that to make a website, you needed to master HTML as well as CSS for style sheets. And here, for Frogan site, now, the entire content on the Frogan site is declared by FSDL. In other words, the time investment it takes to learn FSDL is something that will be profitable because you'll have no other language to learn unless you were a developer that are server-side languages which are the ones that Alexei mentioned earlier, but I'll stop speaking right now because the phones popped up on screen and they seem far less mobile in that size. So I was, I'm showing you mobile phones that... Okay. What I wanted to show you here... Uh, proto these are prototypes of the Frogan's player software that was developed 
So as to try to find a way of surfing with your fingers, whereas at the start of the project, you navigated, surfed only with pointers, mouse devices. Okay, this one is telling us stories here. Okay, as we saw earlier, here we go. You will recognize here a logo. Can you just touch the screen from time to time? You will recognize here a logo, the logo for the Forgans Player software that superpose rectangle to enabling users to recognize the Forgans Player application on their mobile terminal or on the fixed terminal. Now, our browsing experience that we try to develop to make it compatible with what we will also have on your tablet or, or on your computer or television or other terminals, we will now show it to you. Let me now launch a software. There we go. And we can see that it's running on two terminals. One, a terminal running on iOS and the other on Android. Now this, don't drop it. Okay, we will revive a demonstration that Joe created for us some time ago. Joe is in the room. So first of all, we have a slide for Frogan's site, and we'll find this slide. Find this slide on the various terminals as well, and on a PC screen. I couldn't find this slide for you, but it's the same slide that you'll find on top of the other windows on the PC screen. The way you browse on this site is quite easy, because you will see that by moving your finger, on a sort of pad below. I don't know if you can see it well. Okay. You will see that this way we can activate a certain number of buttons, enable certain buttons. This one may be easier to see. By moving my finger, let, I'll show you the same for against side here, we can select different zones, as you can see, on the screen. Now, of course, these zones may be enabled. If I were on a computer screen, they would be enabled by, with my pointer directly. This will enable us to provide for surfing where you and then ergonomics, avoiding huge buttons like what you find on mobile terminals today, preventing easy browsing or the integration of buttons on the interface. So this is a model that will, we made lots of user experiments, experiences around this, so that you can surf with a single hand. If I take the equipment like this, in my left hand with my thumb, I can browse and move around on many foregun sites at the same time, and they're open simultaneously, as you can see. So you can browse by selecting zones, and then I click on the bar to be able to browse on to the next page. Now, this approach enables developers or site publishers to, to make a, a site without having to wor worry about whether or not people will be watching on an iPhone, an Android, or, or on a machine running uh, Linux, Windows, or Windows Phone. I want to be sure that under all circumstances, I'll have the same access to my content regardless of device. And this is brand new. For those who are into uh, content publishing, you know this. When you're on the web, I'm not talking about creating applications. That's a different world, probably even more complex. If I had to come back to publishing content on the internet through the web, we all know that it takes a lot of effort to try to come closer to a homogeneous uh, browsing from one terminal to the other. With Frogan's technology, the aim is to have no difference so that we can create content easily and see it on the terminal that you have in your hands and to say, OK, fine, let's move on to something else. Now I would broadcast it on all terminals. No need to control, no need to invest 
in adjustments to be made to make sure that it is more or less okay. You may say, we know that there have been attempts at solutions on the web trying to make things more or less identically. But we are talking about solutions that are very complex in the final analysis or dependent or the dependent third party libraries, uh, environments with people who have libraries that will probably not be maintained for long. And really, you have a content that has the same ergonomics in the mobile phone and on the bigger screen. That really happens. Generally, you have to do both. With Frogans, you start with this object that's quite small, that allows you to do lots of funny things by surfing. You can imagine extremely varied usages for this in every area. And this is an experience that we can really seek to make continuous on all terminals. For a content publisher, this is brand new. When I spoke about the publishing chain with all the players, for the players themselves, it is interesting. You may say that, yes, since it's simpler to do it, a developer won't be happy. They'll have less, less work. Or an agency will work three times less because they won't need to make adjustments in the longer. That's not true. Today, when you make content on the web. In fact, the budget is so significant to make adjustments that the publishers are always lagging behind with respect to a rising budget, feeling that it's not necessarily, we don't necessarily have the resources. We don't want to pay for a website several times, five times the price of what we paid 10 years ago. All of that, well, site publishers have to uh, uh, forget some platforms and say too bad for this platform or that other platform. And we'll be there for that. For example, that's the approach they had for applications, where they make applications instead of making sites. We're not happy with that at Open3FT. We want all terminals to be able to be addressed. We want publishers to find life easy. And we don't want to continue uh, to make things difficult for them for this type of application. Well, we'll come back in the weeks and months to come and tell you more about these mechanisms, uh, these devices that you can try out. And we rely on the technical teams to do this and make it as clean as possible. It has to be exactly the same experience for users. You should be able to lend your phone to someone else for browsing. If I ask Joe Emanuel for his phone to phone, I can't find the button to phone. But maybe I can find the Frogans icon, and then I'm sure I can make it. And I can browse and surf on the Frogans side, because I'll have exactly the same experience. I shouldn't say that we have the same phone. It's true, too. You're right. Thank you, Alexi. All that's left is a bit of time, not, not a lot, but we do need to take some questions. If you have any questions, Alexi will be happy. Are there any questions? Thank you. Just a question that came over Twitter. It may seem obvious, but I think it's interesting to answer that question here. Namely, if the technology that you just demonstrated, is it open source? This is in connection with the previous presentation on the fact that it's open and available to all. Well, the open source technology. If you're thinking of open source, is the software Frogans player open source? Can, you, can it be downloaded, compiled by anyone, and redistributed? The answer is no. In other words, OP3FT in its mission is there to protect users, and therefore it has to distribute Frogans player. But that means that we ought to avoid situations where people obtain the source. We compile it with nonsense inside and redistribute it instead of OP3FT. That has happened to very well-known video players recently, and we don't want that to happen for obvious reasons, to protect the end user, which is one of our priority missions. But we have nothing to hide in the source code. Of course, it's well written. Michel said that it has been tested all in, in every direction 
by the application construction teams who have absolutely nothing to hide. And we ourselves in this code source use some software libraries that are open source. So OP3FT, in that respect, and this wasn't our absolute priority because we have a lot of work to do, but it will be organizing in the coming months or years. Well, as soon as we can have some time to do that, we'll organize a uh, possibility to consult the code source for, for the player so that improvements can be made to it and contributions can be made. And to make sure, too, that our source code isn't compliant with what we're saying. For example, the fact that it, uh, uh, it uh, respects users' private life to see what the code source, does, source code does on the phone, on the operating system. And then you can see that what we're saying is accurate. So it's not an open source software like uh, a certain number of uh, uh, software released on the internet today. But on the other hand, it is not there to remain closed like a proprietary software that's hiding its horrible code lines. We have code lines that are well programmed by professional teams. They reread it a lot, so we're pretty much proud of our code. And we want it to let it hang around left and right for people to clone it and to put inside uh, Trojan horses and other monsters and that, of, that are not in the best interest of end users. I can't know if my answer is to satisfaction because it was on Twitter, unless the person were to say no straight away. You tell me. Maybe he will tell us, that person will tell us. Well, for those of you who want to participate in the progress of Forgan's technology, the contributor's policy will soon be uh, published, and therefore the development of organ technology is open to contributions while complying with the principles of OP3FT. Are there other questions? In that case, thank you so much, Alexei, for your presentation. And if any questions...